If you were here, you'll remember um, what we talked about was, we looked at some of the, bless, the art of Blessed Fra Angelico on his feast day. And you'll remember that, that one of the things that I really stressed about that is that um, there is a need for us in, in our continuing faith uh, formation journey to look at those who came before us, understand the lives of the Christians who came before us because we are in continuity with them. So uh, in keeping with what we what sort of we talked about last week with regard to art as an expression of their culture, what we're going to be doing today is shifting to look at literature. And I'm really, really thrilled to have, to be able to, to offer you this morning a woman who is both a friend and a colleague, a Dr. Helen Taylor from LSU Shreveport is a professor of English. She's also the Interim Associate Vice Chancellor in Academic Affairs. She has been at LSUS longer than I have, 20... Okay, we're not going to say how long she's been there, but she's been there longer than I have, and I've been there 21 years, so... Um, uh, Helen is a native of South London, and she did her undergraduate studies at Durham University. She came to the United States to do her PhD work at the University of Connecticut, and she never went home. So um, she is really a wonderful speaker. I think you're really going to enjoy her, and she's got some, some great insights on the medieval mind and medieval society. Helen? today and thanks for that wonderful introduction some of which is true <laughs> so, and um, as Dr. White says I've been teaching at LSU Shreveport it's a bit echoey does it sound a bit echoey to you um, for it's actually 28 years wow. so it's taken my years <laughs> so, but I when I first came to Shreveport I thought I would be here for a couple of years you know as a young assistant professor and of course, Shreveport, as it's done with so many people, I, I just felt so welcomed in the community that I've been here for 28 years. So My mother's still waiting for me to come home. Because <laughs> I promised when she put me on that plane to go to graduate school that I'd be home in four years. And... <laughs> so um, I am a professor of English, and my specialty is medieval literature. So I spend most of my time teaching Chaucer and Canterbury Tales and so forth. But my particular research interest, and my, this is what my dissertation was on, is on female devotional literature. And most of the time when I tell people, they say, well, what do you study? And I say, female devotional literature, and they sort of roll their eyes. <laughs> what could that be? Um, but I, in fact, I'm teaching a class at uh, LSU Shreveport right now, and we're looking at 14th century texts by, because there are some, and about women and devotional practice. So I thought today that I would sort of narrow that down and focus, as you can see here, on two saints, Margaret and Cecilia, both of whom have texts written in the 13th and 14th centuries about them. So these texts, of course, are um, they're, they're part of a spiritual practice, which I'll talk about. But they're also very literary texts. So you see the intersection here of um, devotional practice and literature. And I, I think that, from my perspective, the devotional texts give us an idea about the people, and particularly the women, for whom those texts were written. Uh, and then sort of flipping that from the, 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 um, the spiritual point of view, it tells us something about the practices of devotion at the time. So both of those. So I've got this picture here, and both Margaret and Cecilia are in this picture. I love this picture. It's a wonderful 14th century illustration. It's the Virgin. The Virgin is reading a book. And of course, in the 14th century, this might be a little <coughs> unusual as an image of a woman because most women could not read. Um, certainly, most texts were in Latin. Um, they were handwritten, of course, because this is pre-printing press. So when you think that for the normal, um, the normal weekday attendance at church, that the ordinary people in church, A, could not read, B, did not have a Bible, did not have access to the Bible, it was in <coughs> Latin, and it was a heresy to own a Bible. 
And so to see a picture of a woman reading, even when she's the Blessed Virgin, would be something that also marked her out as being different from other women, because that certainly would not be true of ordinary women at the time. How can I tell that Margaret and Cecilia are in this picture? Does anyone know? I mean, they're not labelled. We don't know what they looked like, but there are ways of telling who they are. So Cecilia is the patron saint of music. She's teaching the Christ child how to play the whatever that instrument's supposed to be, zither of some kind. So Margaret is helping the Virgin, apparently, with some gardening. She's got a box of earth and what looks like a wooden spoon, but surely is, is not that. But over here, can anyone see what this is? You can't really see that, can you? It's a dragon. So as we'll see, so Margaret in pictures is always accompanied by a dragon because according to her legend, her story, she is swallowed by a dragon. So when we, we see medieval pictures of the saints, we can usually tell who they are because of the iconography, the images associated with them. So, you know, these days we have a label, or, you know, if you're looking at a picture on, on, the, on the web, you can even hover over it and it'll tell you what it is. But in the medieval period, we have iconography. So if you see an old man with a long beard holding a bunch of keys, you know that it's... Right, so that's, that's, how, that's how it works. Um, also, just before we leave this picture, um, this angel looks very bored indeed at whatever story he's being told. So even angels apparently can be... Um, can <laughs> the two texts that... Uh, the two saints um, whose lives are, are written about in these medieval texts, um, these two particular, Margaret and Cecilia, they are very, very popular in the Middle Ages. And one of the reasons why is that in 1260, um, a Dominican friar called, uh, he's actually from Genoa, Jacobus, it means James from Genoa. Um, and he collected together a hundred or so uh, saints' lives. Uh, of course, it's a Latin text. And there are many, many, in fact, 800 manuscripts. If there's 800 manuscripts, around today of a text from 1260. That tells you how many more there must have been you know, in the, in the centuries afterwards, which attest to its popularity. People didn't take the time to copy over a text like that unless it was something that they really wanted to read. So we've got 800 manuscripts um, of this text from 1260. And then, of course, the printing press, which is developed in about 1450. I mean, that changes everything. You don't need me to tell you that. But William Caxton, who you may have heard of, um, made, a, made a, 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 a printed version of the Golden Legend um, in English, and then it's, it, was a, it was the bestseller of its time. But even before that, it was very, very influential. So the two stories that I'm going to be talking about probably took their origins, at least in terms of the frame of the story, from this source text, the Golden Legend. Uh, there are copies of it in the LSUS library. It's a great read for reasons that I also talk about. I haven't read the whole thing through since graduate school. I've dipped into it since then. But um, it, it's, a, it's a very exciting and dramatic text because Jacobus makes sure that when he retells the lives of the saints, he's making them worth your while. And not just for spiritual reasons. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, so the, the big point I want to make first is that these saints' lives in these medieval retellings are what we call exemplary <coughs> biography. We do not read them, and the, the medieval um, readership knew, or the audience, because they were probably read aloud, knew not to search for authentic, documented detail. That was not the purpose of these texts. <coughs> Exemplary means that they are an example to be followed. And so um, we might, today when we read a biography, if we buy a biography at Barnes & Noble, we might be checking to see in the index 
about where the author got his or her information from, what are the documents, what are the sources, but we don't look for that in these kinds of, of medieval texts. Also, medieval bibliography, <coughs> the writing of saints' lives, has a kind of template to it. That means that if you read one or two of these saints' lives in the golden legend, you're going to feel like you've read them all. And that's why I haven't read the whole thing through since graduate school. Because they start to sound the same. The names are changed. But it's not that Jacobus ran out of plot ideas. It's that for him, hagiography implied a certain number of steps that authenticated the saint. So we're going to see these, what we would call in literature, tropes, little plot patterns, over and over again. I could say a lot about this, and if this were a literature class, I would bore you with an example of some plays and, uh, and other devotional texts. Um, but the saints conform then to this step, these, these plot patterns, because the ideal for these medieval writers was to show how close they were to the life of Christ. And so conformity is the goal. And there are plenty of medieval texts about how sin is deforming, that makes you unlike Christ, and in fact, in many of these medieval texts, the idea is that sin literally makes you ugly. And we can talk a lot more about how Chaucer makes his characters different from each other through warts and scars and bumps on the nose and so forth, because these, um, it's called physiognomy, the medieval idea that your sins were written on your face. There is a play, called Wisdom Who is Christ, it's an allegory, and the soul, Anima, is a character who comes first on stage as a beautiful woman, but after her sin, she becomes ugly, and so the character of Christ in the play is able to reform her so that she is not deformed, you see how the language all works together, and she conforms then to this ideal of beauty for the soul. So you see how that allegory works. Anyway, I won't, well, I won't tell you more about that, but, but reading that play, it's a, it's a wonderful <coughs> dramatization. Again, for a, for a lay audience who could not read. So you put your, your theological ideas into a drama um, or an allegory of this type. Okay, back to the golden legends and these particular saints. So as you can see, these two like most of them, choose martyrdom rather than marriage. This is the plot trope that is common to so many of the, uh, the stories in this collection. And there's a special emphasis on virginity. And it's, it's that aspect that I want to focus on a little bit because a number of the texts that we read in the class that I'm teaching right now, not just saints legends, but also other devotional texts that emphasized virginity. Most of these texts were written for a young female audience. So, we have to bear the readership in mind. And virginity was presented as an antidote, as it were, to the medieval idea, and again I'm going to talk about a very big topic in just a few slides. But the medieval idea that women were inherently more sinful than men, mostly because of Eve, but also from that point, there are so many texts in the medieval period about the dangers of women, uh, as far as men are concerned, you know, there all kinds, all, any kind of sin you can imagine, uh, including even being too talkative, gossipy, etc., etc., you name it. And so I just picked one source text. Um, for this idea. Um, this is Tertullian. Uh, I, I love to read this with my students because they become outraged um, at some of this. 
I guess I'll read it, right? <laughs> Uh, so this is addressed to a female audience. Do you not know that you are an Eve? The sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age. The guilt of must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that forbidden tree. You are the first deserter of divine law. You are she who persuaded him, Adam, whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. So if you're going to be told repeatedly in this and many other texts that you are the devil's gateway, um, that's, that's pretty tough stuff. And this is just a text on, as you can see, on the apparel of women. I mean, Tertullian had a lot to say about women. This is just on clothes and how, you know, the temptation begins with appearance. So I just choose that one text. So my point here is that if women are the devil's gateway, what possible chance do they have for salvation? Virginity is one way to remediate yourself, if you are female, from the sin of Eve. It's a, it's a, I call it a resource here, perhaps that's, that's too secular a term. Um, but one of the reasons why we see these repeated patterns of virgin saints in these collections of saints' lives is to emphasize the fact that these female saints chose martyrdom as virgins because that was one way to, as it were, elevate themselves spiritually because they were already carrying the sin of Eve. In fact, if you read St. Jerome, he actually ascribes sort of bonus points um, if you, when you get to um, when you get to heaven, you have extra points for, for being a virgin. More points than if you're a married woman. If you're a widow, you kind of get extra points too, because at least you escaped the terrible idea of being married. So, I don't want to stress that too much, but um, it's a little bit uh, icky. Um, why have I got this picture? Anyone, anyone know? Yes, it's one of the um, tapestries, wonderful. 15th century tapestries from the Musée de Cluny in Paris. Actually, it's not called Cluny anymore. It's now called the Museum of the Medieval Age or something. But, um, comments on what we see? There on the English coat of arms. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I mean, that's the lion and the unicorn. Mm. But why a unicorn? Why does the unicorn have his, his feet in her lap? Does anyone know? Again, this is sort of medieval iconography. What does this signify about this woman? Anyone know? Okay, so the medieval legend is only a unicorn will sit in the lap of a virgin. And so, because of that, here's a unicorn sitting in a virgin, could be the virgin, but there's no real identification. There's a series of five pictures. Then the unicorn becomes a, a, an icon or a symbol for Christ. One, only one, like him. Only one beast, only one unicorn. And the unicorn um, signifies virginity. Now, virginity, from the theological perspective, <clears throat> in these medieval texts, was recommended, as I've said, as a kind of spiritual remediation. But... One reason why these stories were so popular and why there were 800 manuscripts and that the book continued to be uh, printed and published was that these virgins in the stories are usually assaulted, usually by a pagan, Roman, or other um, powerful male figure, and the stories then become not just a teaching tool, but also an exciting and dramatic story about a young virgin girl who must protect her virginity against a powerful male figure. And usually in the stories, when the young virgin girl rejects the advances of the powerful male figure, he tortures her in graphically violent ways. And so, in these saints' lives, we have sex and violence. 
And so I'm not going to make a comment on what made the story so popular. But if you're reading it, what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading The Life of a Saint. Well, yes, it's The Life of a Saint, but it's got dramatic action. It's got grisly torture details. It's got, if not sexual innuendo, sexual scenes. Some of the, uh, the female saints are sent to work as prostitutes in brothels as part of the, the torture process. So you can see that these saints' lives have more than just um, devotional aspects to them. They are popular because they tell a good story with all kinds of details that might, might be interesting for their own sake. Back to virginity and just to, to, <coughs> to counterbalance Tertullian with You Are the Devil's Gateway, Jerome, of course, who I'm, uh, I've already mentioned, very influential figure in the Middle Ages. If you've read Chaucer's Wife of Bath's Tale and her introduction, I mean, she's a fictional character, but she takes on St. Jerome's uh, dictum about virginity. And she says, well, you know, we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. How can we be, uh, how are we supposed to, to be fruitful and multiply and yet also be virgins? So the ideas of St. Jerome um, were replicated in all sorts of different texts in the Middle Ages. Very, very influential. You don't have to read all of this. I put it up here um, just as a, a source. But Jerome here, and this is um, around 400, he says, I do not disparage marriage when I set virginity before it. Marriage is honored when it is placed next after virginity. And then he tells us that virginity is natural to man, while marriage is a result of the fall. So this was the idea that it's only after the fall that Adam and Eve's relationship was consummated, so that the natural state of man is celibacy. And this is an idea that, is, that comes forward through from Jerome to Augustine and, and further forward. So what Jerome's arguing here is if it hadn't been for the sin of Eve, everybody would be virgins. And we, again, we may wonder how this works out logically, but he does tell us that marriage produces virgins, right? Returning in the fruit what it had lost in the root. He also, in another text, says to, um, in a letter to Eustachium, he also says that you produce children when you convert people to Christianity, and these are your spiritual children. So this is how we can be fruitful and multiply. No one's got any comments? Okay. <laughs> Thought you might have something to say at this point, but no? Yes? There's one problem with that argument. In that, uh, if Adam and Eve had remained virgins, we would have had a total human population of two angles. In perpetuity. Logically, it would not work. He doesn't and address that. Dr. Benjamin says, you know, in the first creation story, be fruitful and multiply. Right. Right. So it, it's certainly problematic. But in the Middle Ages, well, again, if you read The Wife of Bath, she takes on the argument. So, um, but, but in the Middle Ages, Jerome was hugely influential with this idea. So, but, but for a limited audience of these young women, so as part of the persuasion into um, the, the dominance, if you like, of virginity for young girls, the idea that if you want a bridegroom, you can choose Christ. So to accompany the emphasis on virginity, we have a concomitant emphasis on a, an interpretation of the Song of Songs as an allegory about the marriage of the soul and Christ.
And this leads to an idea of what we call the mystical marriage. So, here we have Origen of Alexandria, who wrote a lot of stuff. Um, here's from uh, his uh, homily on numbers. The betrothed then, the husband of a pure and chaste soul, is the word of God, who is Christ the Lord. In both Latin and Greek, the word for soul is female. Um, I mentioned a play well, called Wisdom, Who is Christ. The character anima is female in Latin, for soul. So, souls are female. So even a man can have a female soul that marries Christ. Perhaps the most influential in the, the um, high Middle Ages is Bernard of Clairvaux, his sermon on the Song of Songs. Are you familiar with Bernard? He's, okay, he's, he's probably most famous for his exhortation um, to, for Christians to go on the Crusades as a new form of chivalry, a new form of knighthood. I mean, that's another very influential text. But here, he shows up as an influence in these texts uh, by and for women because of his commentary on the Song of Songs and how he elaborates on the language of the mystical marriage. So here, the soul is wedded to the word. It's the same language that we saw in Origin. Um, approach the word with confidence. Cling to him with constancy. Speak to him as a familiar friend and refer to him in every matter with an intellectual grasp proportionate to the boldness of your desire. Truly, this is a spiritual contract, a holy marriage. And then at the end here, he and the soul are bridegroom and bride. What other bond or compulsion do you look for between those who are betrothed except to love and be loved? And so, jumping ahead a little bit, for many of the female writers of the, uh, the Middle Ages, uh, people like Marjorie Kemp, uh, St. Bridget of Sweden, Marie Donnier, they imagine this as a, not just a, an intellectual concept, but a relationship which can be imagined, which is granted to them in visions. We might think of, of Catherine of Siena's uh, mystical vision of being married to Christ. Marjorie Kemp similarly imagined being married to Christ. Although, in, do you know Marjorie Kemp? She's a 14th century mystic. Uh, in Marjorie Kemp's <coughs> marriage, um, the virgin is the matron of honor and the saints are bridesmaids. I mean, it's a very elaborate wedding. Um, so you can see how this notion can be played out in literature as if it were a real, almost earthly kind of marriage. All right, that brings me, that's the context. Virginity and spiritual marriage. This is the context for these saints' lives. So my, my first saint is Margaret of Antioch. She's the one with the dragon always seen with a dragon. And um, her legend is, in the golden legend, is set in the um, Christian persecutions of the fourth century. I just have a map, in case we don't know where Antioch is, I'm sorry I took this from another slide, another PowerPoint. Um, here's Antioch. So of course the Roman Empire. Um, so in the, um, in the story, of course, many of the saints are not from Rome, some are from Rome, some are from other parts of the <coughs> Roman Empire, where they're being persecuted for their Christianity. Um, July 20th is St. Margaret's Day, but she was expunged in 1969. She's St. Marina in the Orthodox Church. So, I want to talk a little bit now about the text that I teach, which is not the Golden Legend, but currently, in my, in my class at LSUS, we're looking at a group of saints' lives in a manuscript. We call it the Catherine Group, because St. Catherine's in there too. But it is a 13th century manuscript, very, very popular, and it has in it a text called Holy Virginity, which I always tell my students is like something that Batman or Robin would say, Holy Virginity, Batman. <laughs> but I'm sure they didn't really use it like that. But the text, Holy Virginity, is a, a 
seven or eight page long sermon about why young women should be virgins. And it pulls on all the texts that I have referenced, St. Jerome, Origen, and so forth. Clearly, it was written for an audience of young women. And they were probably young women who were recluses, anchoresses, or hermits of some kind, we might call them, living together, not in holy orders, but in one of the um, communities of reclusive, uh, religious, devout women that were very common in the 13th and 14th centuries. You may know about the anchoress Julian of Norwich. Uh, so she was in a single cell. But these young women were presumably living together. Um, and from other details in the text, they, it looks like they lived on a farm because they were growing their own vegetables and so forth. But they were not nuns. And yet they devoted their lives to uh, spiritual devotional practice. We imagine that a, um, probably somebody from the local abbey wrote this text for them. Perhaps he was their spiritual confessor, their spiritual guide, and he wrote these texts. Clearly they were meant to be read aloud, so we imagine that these young girls couldn't read or write. Um, so the story of St. Margaret, when you look at the text, he says, listen to me now. So we know that he was reading it aloud to them. But there are many manuscripts of it. What do all these texts in this group of manuscripts have in common? They're all about virginity. And clearly our author, whoever he was, was following the golden legend story of St. Margaret. Okay, what is the story of St. Margaret that comes from the golden legend and is reproduced in this medieval English text? She's a beautiful 15-year-old girl. She's minding her own business. She's out in the fields. She's a Christian. It's made clear that she's a Christian, even though her father is a pagan. It says that in the text. And she's out in the fields minding her sheep, which is an interesting parallel. She's a shepherd. And along comes Olybrius, the Roman go governor, with his posse. And of course, they see her, and he's much taken with her. And uh, he actually offers to marry her. And um, Margaret refuses to marry him, and she has some long speeches about how she's granted her maidenhood to Christ. Some, some rather forthright language, which um, we don't need to rehearse here. What happens? She irritates Olybrius. I mean, after all, she's a 15-year-old girl, and he's the Roman governor, and he doesn't like this insubordination. And so there are some graphic scenes of torture. She's stripped naked. She's hung up. She's scourged. There's a description of claws, iron claws, ripping her. I'm, I don't really need to go into it. It's really horrible, going on for pages. Again, I refer you back to the idea that why are the torture scenes so extended? Because this was a way to get people to read the text, because it's full of all this drama and violence. She still refuses. She refuses him, so he throws her into prison, and a dragon appears. And the dragon swallows her. But that's not the end of the story, is it? I mean, we already know that's not the end of the story. So, virginity is a superpower. And that's the point of these tales. Virginity gives you power over pagan, Roman governors, and dragons. Very powerful thing to have. And that's, that's what our author is trying to tell his audience. So she makes the sign of the cross and she busts out of the dragon's stomach. I mean, literally flying. The dragon is killed by this explosion through his stomach. And uh, another demon comes and she, she's a 15-year-old girl. She puts her foot on his neck and tells him off, again, in three pages of why she's a virgin and why it's powerful and important. Olybrius, who you know, is not getting any luck with dragons or scourging or anything like that, uh, finally has her beheaded. And so then her soul flies off to meet her bridegroom. So ultimately, of course, she must be martyred, because that, that's part of the plot paradigm. And before she can be martyred, though, she demonstrates the power of virginity through her story. Very compelling. I mean, imagine being a 15-year-old girl in the audience listening to this. How compelling would this be? 
how would this cement the idea that you want to maintain your chastity, maintain your virginity, become a bride of Christ. Um, these are ways to uh, remediate uh, Tertullian's idea that you're the devil's gateway. I mean, this, this, this is the way to get to a young female audience with these stories about dragons and superpowers. Just as a note um, in the story of Joan of Arc, um, St. Margaret is one of the saints, and she's the patron saint of childbirth. And because of, the, because of the rebirth, perhaps, from the dragon's stomach, sort of like a Jonah and the whale, perhaps, kind of idea. Anyway, <laughs> just some pictures to show you. Again, there are many, many texts about St. Margaret, but there are also many, many manuscript pictures. I've just got a random sample here. Um, here... She is, I don't know how a dragon that small was able to swallow her, but um, again, we don't look for, you know, um, de uh, accurate detail. Uh, in interestingly, or not interestingly, blue is often the colour that the female saints are wearing, con connecting them with Mary and so on, so you can identify them. Uh, you can't see this very well. You could see it on the smaller screen. The dragon is curled around her feet. There are his eyes. Can you see his eyes, sir? Barely. Yeah, not a good picture. Just to show you, there's also sculpture. Heads come off, but uh, you see her rising from his back, <coughs> in this case. <coughs> I love this picture. I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> Maybe this is a Libria, so he's just really mad. I don't know. <laughs> There she is. This dragon's got interesting ears. Another good one. He's, he's obviously in pain. He's chewing on her robe here. And that's a motif you're going to see in the next couple of slides. I don't think, it looks to me like the illustrator didn't think the dragon was quite scary enough, so he adds a horn. <laughs> yeah. Again, chewing on the rope, he's got rather nice frills. I mean, again, we could do a whole thing on dragons in medieval art, and, and you know, because nobody had seen a dragon, of course, so the, there are various um, features that they have in common, but they're all a little bit different. This one, he's chewing on the rope again. Yeah. I love this picture. Because, and this is a little bit later, this is not strictly medieval, but look at those puppy dog eyes. <laughs> anyway, let me get to St. Cecilia. Now, the version of St. Cecilia that we read is Chaucer's. Chaucer took the story of St. Cecilia from the Golden Legend, and he gives it in the Canterbury Tales to the second nun. And it's appropriate, of course, that a nun should tell a story of a saint. If you've read any of the Canterbury Tales, you know that not all the stories are suitable to be told by nuns. So, uh, this one is. So she's probably a little bit later. Marcus Aurelius. There's a twist in this one. We have two sorts of virgin stories, and that's why I chose these two saints. In the story of St. Margaret, the virgin saint refuses the oppression by the pagan authoritative governor and is martyred. In the celibate marriage story, the saint is married and refuses to consummate the marriage. In this story, I mean, you can't be disobedient to your parents, right? Because if you're a good girl, you, you have to do what your parents say. And of course, the parents were the ones who chose the husband. So she obeys her parents in marrying Valerian, but on the wedding night, she says, uh-uh, I've got an angel, and he's going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, and you know, my students love this, because they, we imagine what Valerian might have said. <laughs> in Chaucer's version, he says, well, I'm not sure I believe there's an angel. I don't see an angel. He says, if there's another man, I'm going to kill you both. So again, you see how the dramatic action of the narrative compels the reader forward. 
So these tales teach spiritual ideas, but they embed them in these dramatic, interesting stories. So, um, in the story, Cecilia says to Valerian, look, go and see Pope Urban down in the catacombs, and he will vouch for me. So Valerian duly goes down to the catacombs. He is um, persuaded by what Pope Urban has to say, and he is converted. He also converts his brother Tibus. However, once they're converted, they're immediately massacred, uh, martyred, um, and beheaded, because the context of the story is that all Christians are being uh, martyred for their faith. And Cecilia, too, is dragged before the Roman prefect, Almachius. So we've got a parallel, a Librius with Margaret, Almachius with Cecilia. And there's a wonderful dialogue sequence in the story that Chaucer tells. And I often wonder about Chaucer and his interest in women. He's got these incredible female characters like the wife of Bath. And here, in this version of the tale, Chaucer gives Cecilia, again, this incredible authoritative manner. And she stands up to the, to the Roman prefect. She knows that she's going to be martyred. She's just caused her husband and his brother to convert to Christianity and immediately be killed. So she's taking no prisoners. You know, she's, she's absolutely uh, determined on what she's going to do. And she, she says, no, I am not going to bow down and worship your gods. And he says, aren't you afraid of my power? I'm, I represent the Roman Empire. And she says, no, your power is a bladder full of wind. <laughs> so again, you've got a young woman with the superpower of virginity who is ready to meet her bridegroom, who is thus unafraid of any of these worldly, uh, impotent, uh, secular forms of, of, of government and power. <coughs> so, oh, sorry, there's a picture of the angel giving Valerian and Cecilia, she's again reading, coronets of roses and lilies signifying martyrdom. There they are again, that's Tibur's too. Do you know what they're holding in their hands? They're palms, they're signifying martyrdom, palm, palm fronds. So, um, one interesting thing that Chaucer does is to construct the interview. Um, clearly, again, the saint is a a type, as we say, of Christ. She is brought, she's going to be, she's celibate, she's going to be martyred, she's brought for the interview with the Roman authority. Um, but again, <coughs> I like to talk about the subversive power of virginity because a young girl's virginity in these stories is offered as an antidote to secular power. That's what <coughs> empowers a young girl who in the secular, whether you think about the feudal system or you think about gender roles or whatever it is, a young girl, an illiterate young girl would have no power in that society, in that culture. But it's her virginity that gives her the power and the authority to talk back to the representatives of secular power. So, Almachus is not having this. First, uh, Cecilia is tortured for three days in a, in a bath of fire, and we probably don't have time to go into all the <laughs> connections and parallels there, but she walks through the fire unscathed. She feels no heat, not a drop of moisture, falls from her brow, says Chaucer. So I invite you to think of the parallels. Um, and then uh, Almachus says, right, just chop off her head. But the executioner just can't get the axe to work properly, and Chaucer tells us that her head is almost severed. And yet, she lives for three days preaching and singing until she finally flies to heaven again to meet her bridegroom. Just a final note about Saint Cecilia. Uh, I've talked about how she's a virgin saint, um, just like Saint Margaret. They both have this power of virginity. But um, if you've been to the Church of St. Cecilia in Rome, okay, so here's a story, this is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The body was discovered in the 4th century 
and the tomb was opened again in 1599. And Clement VIII summoned the sculptor Moderna to make a statue to replicate what was seen in the tomb. And then the tomb was closed again. And so uh, there is a sculpture of a small girl's body with the neck almost severed. It has a, well, I'll show you. And so that is supposed to be what, in 1599, was the state of the saint's body. And the church of St. Cecilia in Trastevere is supposedly on the, the place of her house. And in Chaucer's retelling, he says, you can go and see her house. It is now a church. So that's there. And this is the statue. And so you can't see it here, but there's the mark here. Oh, look, there it is. And that is what the sculptor saw in 1599 in the tomb. That's all I have for you today. because there wasn't sufficient documentation of any kind to establish her authenticity. And so many of the medieval saints. <coughs> you know, obviously in the medieval period, the, the process for sainthood was not quite as strict as it is today. So I think it's that the, the, the calendar just couldn't support um, her documentation. And, and sometimes, you know, when we hear about uh, saints no longer on the general calendar. So, for example, St. Christopher. What we used to have a feast day of St. Christopher, and then uh, with Vatican II, all of a sudden we don't see him on the, on the general calendar. A lot of times when, the, when, the, when a, a saint, as it were, drops off the general calendar and only remains on a particular calendar, a national calendar, um, sometimes people think, oh, what, he got defrocked or, you know, whatever, you know, and, and, and it's just because, I mean, so, so we have so many saints that make their way to the general calendar, and, I mean, in the, the 19th uh, and 20th centuries especially, um, so, so a, a lot of the devotion to a, a, any number of these saints kind of takes secondary place, and these other saints, as it were, kind of bump them off the off that date. And, and if, if you look at a number of the uh, lives of the saints, sometimes you'll, you'll find the saint of the day, and you'll see like a dozen different saints in there, a whole long list of it. But the one on the top is the one that we're usually most familiar with, and we're celebrating that person's feast day. So, so sometimes when you, I'm not, I'm not sure about St. Margaret, but sometimes when you hear about a saint and they're no longer on the general calendar, just don't think that somehow the church said, so, oops, we made a mistake, and uh, um, so, and who knows what, what a dragon would be, by the way, uh, yes? So, by the high enlightenment of Isaac, then, when you see women like Julian Norwich and Dr. Kim, that sort of plays into what we were just talking about, about the way that this the marriage, and, and let's face it, it's not the way it's painted, it was a reality for the medieval women, right? that that's what their married life was like. So, so could you elaborate on Yes, that? stepping out choices? stepping out further. I'm going I'm going out there, so reel me back if I go out too far. But I, I asked. Okay. <laughs> yes, Dr. White asked me, so it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> there are many uh, recent scholarly treatments of some of these women who make a persuasive argument that given that how horrible the realities of life might have been for ordinary women that claiming sanctity, that claiming um, a life that took you away from the realities of ordinary marriage, and just generally being a woman in the Middle Ages can't have been that great when you think about it. But some of these figures, like Marjorie Kemp in particular, claimed this lifestyle as, a, as an escape. That if you, as Marjorie Kemp does at the age of 40, you've had 14 children living, I mean, who knows how many others, um, 
And if you, at the age of 40, you say to your husband, I'm done. I don't, I'm not doing it anymore. And I want to um, be a celibate, and I'm going to go to the bishop and get a white robe so that I can preach. There's a wonderful scene in the book of Marjorie Kent, which is an actual book written by an English woman in the um, early 15th century. And she says they're walking along the road, and her husband says to her, um, you know, can we uh, resume conjugal relations? You know, I've had enough of this. And she says to him, I'd rather have my head cut off. <laughs> and he says, Marjorie, you are no good wife. Which is a real understatement. Um, but finally, she persuades him because she says, look, I'll pay your debts if you let me go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So she pays his debts. And I mean, so it becomes a financial transaction. And then she becomes a holy woman. And she goes on pilgrimages. And she preaches. And she's arrested for lollardy, which, of course, is the the heresy. I mean, she's a woman preaching. Um, so there is a, an idea that perhaps some of these communities of women, I mean, thinking about the Beguinages in Belgium, which were communities of religious women, and of course those were all closed down, but these were in many ways refuges um, from the realities of being a woman in the 13th and 14th century. And that doesn't take anything away from what would have been perhaps a real religious zeal, a real commitment on the part of these women. It's just that you see that juxtaposition of, of that their faith with the reality of medieval life, which would have been very difficult. Well, and when you think about it, and this is, this is true in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, he has 29 pilgrims going on a pilgrimage to Canterbury, and only two are women. One is the wife of Bath, who of course is this feisty, boisterous, chatty woman who's had five husbands, and she's clearly looking around for six. And then you've got the prioress and her second man, so I guess technically three women. Those are the only two women in a group of, tw of 27 others, uh, merchants and clerks and doctors and millers and so forth. Why does Chaucer need only two women? Because those are the only two roles available for women. If you've got, if, if the Canterbury Tales is a representative of, of, of the panorama of medieval life, you only need a nun and a wife, and that's covered women. You see what I mean? So you've got two. So my point here is that if the only roles available for women in the Middle Ages were either to join an enclosed order and become a nun, or to be a wife in the secular world, some of these holy women are forging a middle ground between the two roles. They don't take vows and join an order. And yet they are removed from the world of marriage and all its concomitant horrors, if you read our texts, uh, by declaring themselves as celibates and uh, with, a, with a religious vocation. So it's a middle ground, perhaps. Maybe a superpower is in the Middle Ages would be going on a crusade, because when you came back, you always were considered, you know, almost superhuman. Yeah, or going on a pilgrimage, pilgrimage to absolutely. Rome, uh, to, uh, or Jerusalem. possessing a relic. I mean, we, I'm straying over to your territory now, but yeah, yeah. Interesting, the, um, the, the use of the, the graphic uh, the, to draw people to the holy. Right. Instead of what, what we do in these days, the use of the graphic to, to keep us from holiness. See, I knew you had some more questions in you. <laughs> Thank you again You're for welcome. being here. Thank you for having me.